Good morning. So I'm here to talk about marine aquarium water testing. I'm going to talk about what sort of things can we test for. We test for temperature. Everybody needs to test for temperature. You can get things in a nice range there. Salinity, that's an important one. pH, of course. We also do alkalinity. Calcium, magnesium, the big three there. And nutrients, nitrate and phosphate. What other things do we test for? Ammonia in recycling tanks, you know, strontium, potassium is getting popular, and then there also are trace elements, the uh, you know your copper, and your lead, and your tin, and that sort of stuff. But you've got to send some samples off to an ICP testing lab like Triton in order to test for those things. So how do we test for these things? There, everybody loves the probes. Probes is everybody's favorite way to test something. Simple, you stick it in the water and you get a continuous real-time reading. Probes are wonderful things because you don't have to do anything aside from stick it in the water and get your reading. But a lot of things we can't test for with, with probes. So we have to use titrations, the test kits where you get out and you have your sample and you put something in there and you add your reagent and you measure the reagent and you have to figure out when you have to stop and take the reading. Um, so a lot of the test kits are done using titrations. There also are colorimetric tests. So these are the tests where you put the reagent in the solution and you wait a certain amount of time and it turns a certain shade and now you have to use a color chart and then figure out where does it match. So the colorimetric tests are another common way that we test for things in tanks. And then Hannah has come out with the, the, these handy handy little checkers, the handheld colorimeters. And these are really convenient ways of testing, and a lot of people use those because they make things nice and easy. And then, of course, there are the contract laboratories, like Tractor, where we can send water off, and in a few weeks we get our results. I'm going to talk today primarily about the things that we test for in our fish room, the things we do at home. So, probes was the first thing I mentioned. And I want to go into a little bit of detail, but not too much, about how a pH probe works. pH probes basically are measuring a voltage that's generated when you stick the probe in the solution. There's a reference electrode that's made of typically just a silver chloride, and it's sitting in a solution of potassium chloride usually that's a neutral solution. And so there's your, your, your reference electrode is always hanging out at the pH of 7.0. Then there's another chamber where there's the measuring electrode that's also silver chloride. It's also sitting in a potassium chloride solution. And it's contained within this, this glass membrane, this glass bubble that is very thin and special glass that allows the hydrogen ions in the solution, because that's what you're measuring when you're measuring pH, you're measuring the concentration of the free hydrogen ions that are in the solution. And so the hydrogen ions will interact with that glass, it'll cause the charge to change in the measuring solution, but because the reference electrode is separated from the measuring electrode, the hydrogen ions don't affect that solution. So there's a charge difference of potential between the two different electrodes, and so that this voltage gets created when you're, when you're measuring a solution that's anything besides 7.0. The, the more acidic the solution is, the higher the voltage is, and the more basic the solution is, the lower the voltage is. There are various other different types of probes, and I'm not going to go into all that, but I just wanted to touch upon uh, you know, what's really going on when you use a pH probe to measure things. Titrations. Now, most of the test kits that we use involve titrations. And titration is a big fancy word, but all it really is is, is you're, you're taking a certain amount of sample, and it has a substance in there that you're going to be, you're wanting to measure. You know, the, 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 it was, chemists refer to that as the analyte. And so you know, it might be alkalinity, it might be calcium, it might be magnesium, but these are the, this is the, the thing that you're trying to test for. When you do a titration, what you're really doing is you're adding a reagent that has some other chemical that is going to react with the analyte that you're testing for. And, and it, the reaction is somehow going to consume that analyte. And all titrations have what they call. Hey, Jim, is, is there an easier word than the analyte? The, the stuff. The stuff. Okay. The stuff right. that you're measuring. I'm seeing some eyes glazing <laughs> over here with this analyte titration. 
So the drops. analyte is not. It's the stuff you're measuring. It's drops. Titration is drops, right? And so, well, so with alkalinity, we, you always have a stuff. So it's get to the end point, okay? So you have to figure out where's the end point of the titration. That's where you stop putting the drops in and time to take the reading. And so with all titrations, you need some way of detecting where is that end point. But anyway, so you notice that he uses the word here, equivalence point, and I've been using the word end point. Now, those two things get used interchangeably, but they're not really interchangeable. Um, what the end point is, is when you're able to know that you should stop the titration. But, and hopefully, in a perfect world, when you're doing a titration, the, the end point is also at the equivalence point. But the equivalence point is chemically where the titration is really over with. So the challenge in doing a titration is to get a method that allows you to, to have your end point coincide with the true equivalence point of the titration. And so, what, what, is, what, is the, what is the equivalence thing that we're talking about at the equivalence point? Well, you can think of it as I added enough reagents to react with all of the analyte, the stuff I'm measuring for. There's the equivalence between the amount of, of acting, the chemical that's in the reagent that's reacting with the stuff and the stuff that I'm measuring. And so that way, if you, if you know how much sample you took, and you know how much reagent you took, and you knew the concentration of the reagent, you could figure out the quantity of the analyte, the stuff that was in the water that you're testing for. In the, the case of the, uh, the salivary alkaline in the test, for example, you use an indicator dye. In the first few sort of drops that you put in there, you're putting in the indicator dye that changes color at a pH that's very close to the equivalence point of, 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 of alkalinity titration. Now, that's typically around pH 4.5, but it's variable. Um, the exact pH at which that equivalence point happens, it varies based upon the amount of alkalinity that's in the sample, the salinity of the sample, the temperature. Um, it also, when you're doing the titration, you know, I mentioned salinity of the sample. Well, you're changing the salinity of the sample the whole time that you're doing the titration because you're adding, you know, the, that reagent is basically, it's a really diluted acid, it's almost all water that you're adding. So you're, you're lowering the salinity of the sample in the course of the titration, and that's going to change the... Okay, so why does this matter? So it's magic, yeah. But it's going gonna, it's gonna to change the exact pH at which the end point happens. Now what's really happening in terms of the equivalence point... Oh, sorry, another graph. Yeah, another graph. So what's really going on when you're, when you're doing this titration is, yeah, uh, you know, like I said, the equivalence point, you can think of it as you've got an equivalent amount of sample and an equivalent amount of reagent, and that's the end point. But the true equivalence thing that's going on from a chemistry perspective, okay, what this chart is, I have to back up and talk about this chart here. This is uh, a, a carbonic acid and carbonate speciation chart, that's what the, the, the One chemists thing. call it. Nice, another nice big word. So, your carbonate, your bicarbonate, your, your CO2 that's in the water, it takes various different forms depending upon the pH of the solution. So if, if you have a really high pH, like pH 12, what this chart is showing you is that the, almost all of the stuff is in the form of carbonate. There's hardly any bicarbonate and virtually no carbon dioxide. More around... That's what those symbols mean? More, what's that? That's what the, that's CO, CO2? CO2, yeah. And so the HCO3, that's bicarbonate, and the CO3 is, is carbonate. So around pH 8 ish, where we keep our tanks. Carbonates are alkalinity, right? Yeah, these, they're all alkalinity. Carbonate, carbonate to bicarbonate is alkalinity. So around pH, pH of 8 ish, where we keep our tanks, it's almost all bicarbonate. There's hardly any carbonate left, and there's hardly any CO2. During the course of this titration, while we're adding acid, we're dropping the pH of the, of the, the, the water, and we're bringing it down about to pH 4.5, where the end point there is. But you notice in the chart, the, the bicarbonate, the dot, you know, the dashed line in the, in the lower left corner there, uh, where it's about 4.5, it's not all the way zero. It's not all the way gone. So the equivalence thing that we're going for here in, in, in doing this, this titration is really where the amount of the, the quantity of bicarbonate ions left in the solution is, is equivalent to the hydrogen ions that's in the solution. So that's, that's how titrations work. And you can tell Jim really loves titrations. Okay. <laughs> colorimetric tests. So examples of, uh, of colorimetric tests that we use. 
Um, there's nitrate and phosphate are common examples. Uh, pH is another one that, that when you're using the, the like an API test kit, that's another form of a colorimetric test. So the Salford nitrate test kit. In this case, you're adding some reagents and, and allowing some time to pass, and then when sufficient time has passed, you're going to compare the, the, the solution to your color card there, and hopefully you'll be able to figure out uh, what your, your concentration of nitrate is. Phosphate is very similar, except you're looking for a blue color instead of a pink color. With the um, API test kit for pH, when you're using that, although I don't recommend anyone to use that, but it's a handy example of what I'm talking about. Um, you know, if you're not you're not testing for you're not trying to tell what the intensity of the color is, what the shade is. You're actually going with hue. It's, a, it's an indicator that changes color depending on pH. But these are still both colorimetric tests where you're having to compare the color of the solution to some sort of a chart and, and eyeball. These are really susceptible to interferences by by uh, artificial light. The, the light, the quality of the light you're trying to do this under can have a real impact. If you're doing any sort of colorimetric test, I always recommend using daylight, basically. Whenever possible, use daylight as your light source, because that's going to be the, 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 uh, the best light to be using. So now, where, there we are. So, how good are these tests that we're doing? Okay, what, what is, you know, how, how, how accurate can they be? This is one question that everybody always wonders about when we're doing tests. So I want to talk about the uh, manufacturer's stated accuracy on some of these tests. So for alkalinity, we got Salford says that their, their test is accurate to within 0.3 dKH. And you know, when you think about it, it's like we're talking about, what does that mean? That means that whatever number you get, it could be the real answer, the real answer could be plus or minus 0.3 dKH. So when they say they have an accuracy of 0.3 dKH, and it's not just salivates, it applies to all of, the, all of the kit manufacturers. They're really talking about the inaccuracy of the test, okay? They're not talking about the accuracy. They're talking about how inaccurate are they? What's, what's, the, what's the, the wiggle room here? Uh, another way of putting that is uncertainty. Red Sea, their uncertainty is 0.14 dKH. The ELOS test kit is 0.5 dKH. It's limited by the fact that it's, each drop is 0.5 dKH, so their accuracy and their resolution are one and the same. The HANA checker claims 0.2 dKH or 5% of the amount you're measuring, whichever is greater. Well, that 0.2 dKH corresponds to it's 5% of, of a dKH level, an alkalinity level of 5.6 in the tank. So most of us, I think, run our tanks a little bit higher alkalinity than 5.6. So the, the HANA is going to be, you know, if you're running a dKH of 8 in your tank, then that uncertainty is 0.4. So uh, then there's the, the KH Garden, the, the, the new kid on the block in terms of, uh, of, of alkalinity testing. Their stated accuracy is 0.33 dKH. So generally, these test kits or test methods have um, um, uncertainty of two to five percent of the of the measured value, the amount of alkalinity you're testing for. Calcium test kits, we've got Salivert at 10 ppm, Red Sea at five, Elos at 10. The Hannah Checker. What they say is it's six percent. So at, at a calcium level of 420 parts per million, that's an uncertainty of 25 ppm, which is actually, and this is the new one, by the way. This is the new Hannah checker that's got the little micro pipette for taking the sample. So except for the Hannah, all these other uh, titrations that we commonly do, their uncertainty is around one and a quarter to two and a half percent of the of the amount of calcium that you measure. Magnesium, Salver 30 ppm, Red C 20, the Elos is 50, and so these have generally one and a half to four percent. So you can see there's a trend here. All of these titrations have an uncertainty of somewhere around like two-ish to four-ish percent of the amount of the substance that you're measuring. Okay. Uncertainty. Why? Why can't we have an accurate test kit? Why are all these? Why are all these test kits advertising numbers that that are in that range of, of uncertainty. Well, there are a couple of different kinds of, of uncertainty or error they, that can be introduced into test methods. Uh, they're categorized basically as systemic error and random error. 
So systemic error is it's just basically it's the error that's inherent in the test method. When you take a sample, you, you, you might not get the exact four millimeters that they're saying. You might, you, you might take a little bit more sample or a little bit less sample. Um, even in, in professional laboratories, when they're using volumetric glassware, the volumetric pipettes that they use that are very accurate always have an uncertainty in terms of it's going to be 10 millimeters plus or minus. You know, there, at every stage, at every step in, in the process, there's an opportunity for error. And even if you're trying to do things perfectly and follow the instructions perfectly and make sure that the, the, the bottom of the plunger lines up exactly with the middle of the line of the syringe and all that, there still is opportunity for error. The syringe might not be exactly correct. It might be a little bit off. So this is where the sources of uncertainty come from. And now, that's the, systemic, that's the systemic error or uncertainty. Then there's the random error uncertainty, which is stuff that's besides, it's not inherent to the method, it's, you know, stuff happens when you're doing testing. By far, the great, like Rich said, the, the number one single point of failure that's most common in the reading system is the read keeper. So in, the, in the, the analytical world, the number one source of random error, again, is the human being doing the test, because people can screw things up in all sorts of unimaginable ways. Now, uncertainty is, affects basically both your accuracy and your precision of the test. And I want to take just a minute to go over what's accuracy and what's precision, because those words get used a lot, and people think they know how to use them, and they use them interchangeably, and they're not the same thing. So, how many, how many target shooters do we have in the room? Lots of hands go. Terrence, yeah, that's good. And so... Lots of guns in Louisiana. It's really, so it's really simple. When you're testing, when you're measuring, you know, substances into solutions, when you're testing for things, you're analyzing this, there, it really is a correct number. There is a true value. There are exactly so many calcium ions in that water. And so what accuracy is, is getting the right number. It's getting the bullseye. Precision, on the other hand, is being able to hit that number over and over and over again when you're doing repeated tests. It's the, the, the repeatability of what you're doing. So you can think of it as accuracy is hitting the bullseye and precision is nice tight grouping. And so that's the difference between accuracy and precision. And people often, I find people usually use the word precise when what they really mean is accurate. We want our tests to oh, ideally be both precise and accurate. But uh, also, it should be noted that in the reef keeping community, you know, stability promotes success. Between the two, uh, there's a general consensus that precision is really the more important quality than accuracy. You know, you're not chasing some specific number. What's most important is to be able to, to get the, and have it be constant, and so you're getting the same number over and over again, so that you know your parameters are nice and stable. So. In terms of uncertainty and the, the human factor, the, the, the random error in our testing, what, you know, what are the types of things that can go wrong? What are the common sources of these errors and that will lead to poor accuracy and poor precision? Well, one of them is the way people use syringes. Uh, this is kind of a, uh, an out there example, but the picture on the left there, I pulled up a forum where a guy was talking about, hey, I'm doing my magnesium test and my results always come in higher than they should. And you know, he did a picture of how he's taking his sample. And so he says, oh, I'm supposed to do three milliliters. So I pull the plunger out and I stick it in the water and then I pull the plunger more until the water comes up to that three milliliter line. Well, what he didn't get is that, that that conical black shape in the bottom of the plunger is, is matches this conical shape in the bottom of the syringe. And what he's supposed to do is start with the syringe plunger all the way pushed down, of course, and then pull it to where the, the bottom edge of the black plunger is, is lined up with a three milliliter mark. So he's actually taking more like 3.2 milliliters there. It's like, no wonder your magnesium results are coming in higher. All these, all these titration tests, because the Red Sea and, and the salad breads, all have the little one milliliter syringe with the plastic tip that you use for delivering the reagent. And there's the uh, ubiquitous questions on the forums about this little air bubble that, hey, I did my reagent and I got this air bubble in there, and is that right, or am I doing it wrong, or do I worry about that, or do I measure for the bottom of the air bubble, or what? And, well, the answer is that air bubble's fine. Don't worry about it. Just follow the instructions. Take the plunger up to one mil, and you measure the bottom of the plunger, and just don't look at that air bubble. It's all, it's all, just, it's all good. So but this is a, a, another common uh, source of error is people not, re not realizing what's going on and thinking maybe I should, I should look at the bottom of the air bubble for my reading, and they'll take the reading incorrectly. 
this this red light stays on. This is another slide deck pulled off of, of uh, the forums. The colorimetric test. This guy got two different salivary nitrate test kits, but the two different cards look radically different from each other. It's like, well, which, which one do I use? Which one do I trust? And this is just an example of, the, of one, another method uncertainty with this particular one that is, in fact, systemic, is the card could be wrong. It could be faded. It could be printed incorrectly. And so who knows what the real number is? And then there's people who just have no clue because they can't see the colors correctly, all right? And I'm not sure what this says. So yeah, the human errors that get introduced are the sampling errors, the syringe problems. There's the whole, oh yeah, the whole um, drop in screw size. With things when you're having to deliver drops of things, you know, there, it, it's, it, do you hold the bottle directly up and down or do you have, can you angle it? And, and that, you know, it's, the way that you hold the bottle can affect the drop size, and so sometimes when the number of drops you're measuring is is how you're doing the test, the drop size can be a factor in, in the, the accuracy of the test. The wait time, and so the wait time, uh, if if the test says you should wait three minutes and then take the reading, it really matters. Uh, if it says take wait ten minutes to take the reading, that also really matters that you have a correct and accurate timing on when you do take the reading, because the color is going to typically continue to change. And so if you don't wait long enough or if you wait a little bit too long, that's going to affect your reading. And then there's the whole vision thing of can I see the color correctly? Um, ambient light, the, uh, the uh, red sea potassium test. Is, is one that's really affected by ambient light. Uh, there's this, for one thing, the color change is subtle to begin with. This purplish to a bluish color that you're looking for. But uh, I actually found, I was getting frustrated. I was doing the, the, the red sea potassium test in my, in my fish room at night, and I would never get to the end point. It'd just keep going and keep going and keep going. And so then I took the vial and I walked to the other end of the room where there's a different color light in the fixture. And also, boom, I could see that, oh, it, it's clearly blue, okay? But this other light over here had more, it was a warmer light, and so it had more red in the spectrum. And so that made the blue look purple, no matter how, how blue, no matter how much reagent I put in. So I could, I could literally walk from one end of the room to the other, and, and on this end of the room, I'm not done with the titration. On this was the room, I've already way overshot it. Scoops. This is one that, 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 another one that comes up in the forum. Oh, with scoops, which says you have to put one scoop of powder. And, and people get in these heated arguments about, about you know, uh, is it supposed to be heaping, or do I have to take a razor blade and scrape it off and make it exactly level? Or, or what, what's the deal with, you know, how much powder? And if I screw it up, am I going to screw the test up? Well, the fact of the matter is, for most all these tests, anything that tells you to take a scoop and put it in, you really just have to have some of the stuff. The size of the scoop really doesn't matter. Typically, you're putting an indicator dye in there, and if you just get enough indicator dye to where you can see the color, you're good. So don't stress out about the scoop, and don't stress out about, you know, I have to make it exactly one, oh, shoot. You know, if I get too much, it's gonna screw everything up. No, don't worry about it. So how do professional laboratories deal with these problems? The professional laboratories actually use manual titration also still today. As much as, as much as we have these instruments that can measure all sorts of things, uh, in the case of wine, there's certain wines that for whatever reason they have a little bit too much CO2 in them or they have a little bit too much sugar in them and that makes them ineligible for running on this particular instrument. So they will do titratable acidity. You know, for, for winemakers, titratable acidity is the inverse of what alkalinity is for us. But it's the thing that they always do the titration test for. So you've got the stir bar and the little magnetic stir and the flask and the, and the, the 50 mil burette and, and they quite literally use indicator dyes and using phenol thalian indicator dye to detect, detect the endpoint and they're doing just a, a, a you know, professional chemistry way of doing a titration just like you would and uh, they uh, is right in line with what our salivary test kits have Colorimetric analyzers. I have this one because the, our, our laboratory has several of these. These are uh, these uh, Siemens uh, Abia 1200s. They're typically used in clinical environments for blood and urinalysis, but we've repurposed them to do wine testing with different reagents. Uh, but these ones basically do something very similar to what the salivary nitrate or the, the um, your various uh, phosphate test kits do. They have the reagents in there and they wait the correct amount of time. They use a colorimeter to measure the intensity of the color of the results. Uh, and it's a $100,000 instrument that can do, you know, hundreds of samples an hour 
Um, but it's really just doing the exact same thing that we do in, in, our, in our fish rooms. So I want to smooth segue into alkalinity monitoring devices um, and that, are, that are coming onto the market. There's the KH Guardian, which, uh, which is currently on the market. There's the KH Director, which is a GHL's product. There's the uh, Focustronic Alphatronic. Now, none of these are, are on, actually on the market yet. And then Pacific Sun also has a product. These are all pre-release. Now, as far as I'm aware, each and every one of these devices is using a, the, in, the endpoint detection method they're using is to use a pH meter to measure the, the pH of the solution. They do the titration until they get to however it is that they're figuring out what the correct endpoint is. Now, my alkalinity monitor uses a different approach and very specifically wanted to not use a pH meter because while that is the, the classic way of detecting the endpoint of your titration curve for an alkalinity titration, I didn't want to deal with the issues of calibration and fouling and drift on the probe. I just felt like that was not going to be reliable enough. So I developed an optical detection method. Got ahead of myself. <laughs> an optical detection method that, uh, that, that is, is not susceptible to those problems I just described. It's virtually maintenance free. The, 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 there is a sensor and an LED light source, and those never wear out. They, again, there's, there's no maintenance to be done there. It just runs and does its thing. I use a single pump design that minimizes systemic error. Again, there's that systemic error uncertainty thing. Um, all of these other devices, as far as I'm aware, each user are using multiple different pumps, one for the sample and one for the reagent. And there are just issues there, where as the, as the pumps wear and as the tubing wears, the rate of delivery of the liquid is going to change slightly. And that's, you know, the whole thing that you're doing in a titration is you're getting the ratio of sample to the ratio of reagent, and that ratio is what determines, you know, what your, your result is. And so a single pump, even though there will be some wear and some change in the flow of the, of the fluids over time, the, it will equally affect both the sample and the reagent, so that uh, this, this ratio stays the same even though the actual flow rate is different. And with this device, it's, it's been hammered on, it's been hammered on all last year and this year, and, and Neptune has had prototypes, and they've been looking at it also. We very reliably can get an accuracy of 0.05 dKH. It's, it's less than 1%. The, the uncertainty really is approaching half a percent of the measure we are. I'm really happy with the performance of it. Yeah! Woo! So, <laughs> thank you. So, what's next? So, I can do all the movie with my name, Gizmo. You know, what, what, I wonder, what might we be able to test for in addition? I think it's good. It's really good. Thank you very much. All right, let's give it up for Jim. Great job, Jim.